and welcome to another fabulous episode of Thyroid Refresh TV, a podcast dedicated to helping you live a thyroid healthy lifestyle. We're so glad to be back with you again. I'm Dana Bowman. And I'm Ginny Mahar, and we are the dynamic duo behind Thyroid Refresh and Thyroid 30. And we're thrilled to be here today with Dr. Alan Christensen, NMD, to talk about metabolism. Dr. Christensen is going to teach us how we can turn up the dial on our metabolism so we can lose weight, reclaim our energy, nourish our liver, and feel amazing. So welcome, Dr. Christensen. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, gals. Uh, thanks so much for having me. I'm a fan of what you guys are up to here and just jazzed to be with. So let's have some fun. Yeah, definitely. Before we jump in, I want to read your bio really quickly for those few people who may not know who you are. Dr. Alan Christensen is a naturopathic endocrinologist who focuses on thyroid function, specifically Hashimoto's and hypothyroidism, and Graves' disease. He has been actively practicing in Scottsdale, Arizona since 1996 and is the founding physician behind Integrative Health. He's a New York Times bestselling author whose books include The Metabolism Reset Diet, The Adrenal Reset Diet, and The Complete Idiot's Guide to Thyroid Disease. Dr. Christensen regularly appears on national media like Dr. Oz, The Doctors, and The Today Show. He's the founding president behind the Endocrine Association of Naturopathic Physicians as well, and we are so thrilled to have him on the show with us. <laughs> yeah, this is a this is a big time thyroid hero, guys. So get comfy and ready for a great show. So <clears throat> let's dive right in. We're so excited about your most recent book, The Metabolism Reset Diet. And I know we have a lot of people listening, myself included, who have had it just up to here with their slow. <laughs> underactive metabolism and it yeah. feels like something we're sort of stuck with like our eye color our height i mean is that true can we change our metabolism can you give us some hope dr c you know the exciting thing is that it can change for sure and it's a function of how your thyroid is working how your liver is working and the good news is it's those are things that can improve given the right circumstances yeah, you point to the liver, you know, uh, in like strongly in your book. That's a, like a really strong theme throughout the book, and uh, just as that being key to improving our metabolism. So, can you can you go into some detail on how that is such an important factor for us? For sure. So I, I would pull apart the rate of metabolism and then the flexibility of metabolism. So we think a lot about the rate, and that's just you know how much fuel your body burns in a day, and it's super important. But I think that there's a bigger struggle with the flexibility, which we don't think about. So what I mean by that is, if you know someone who magically seems to see at a good weight, it's not necessarily that their metabolism is higher, but they've got more leeway. There's never a day in which we get exactly how much food we need to supply our body's energy needs. It never happens. We always get a little more, a little less. It's never going to be precise. And the degree to which your metabolism is flexible is the degree to which a little more doesn't cause catastrophic weight gain like pounds overnight, and a little less doesn't mean you're exhausted and you've got brain fog. So when your metabolism is healthy and flexible, the times where your food intake is somewhat above needs, that's okay. Your body stores that in harmless ways that you can tap into later on for energy. And that's what you do in the days where your food intake happens to be a little lower than your needs are. So your energy should be steady, your weight should be on track and stable, and that shouldn't require heroic discipline or fighting cravings to stay that way. So that's what it means to have a good, flexible metabolism back again. Hmm. So you said, you said it stores it in harmless ways. What does yeah. that mean? <laughs> yeah, so awesome question. So I think about everything in the diet in this conversation being relevant as far as fuel goes. So our diet is essential nutrients. It's a lot of things for our flora. There's, there's so many facets to it. But right now, in terms of energy and weight, it's really the fuel part that matters the most. And we struggled hard trying to figure out if the problem was consuming the wrong kind of fuel or the wrong quantities of fuel and carbs, fats, ketones. At the level of being burned for energy by your liver, they're actually identical. You know, there's a lot of breakdown that goes on, but they're finally made into a thing called oxaloacetate. So yeah, carbs, fats, ketones, you, you break down little pieces, they're all nothing more than oxaloacetate. So your liver can't tell them apart. But what does happen is that it can store them in two compartments. So one compartment's called triglyceride, and that's like a slow burning log. And the other compartment is glycogen, and that's like matches or kindling. 
And if your liver is healthy, you've got some nice logs that can keep you warm over a cold night, but you've also got some matches and kindling you need to get the logs going. Now, what happens when the liver is unhealthy is there's a lot of logs, you know, maybe they're kind of damp and soggy, and there's just not enough kindling to get those logs going. And in that case, even if your food intake is reasonable, you know, your body has energy it could tap into and you didn't, didn't even like overeat, but you can't tap into it. And so the double whammy is it's stuck. You know, there's like, like the gas tank keeps expanding, but your car is not getting fuel. So you're, you're tired, there's brain fog, and there's even cravings. And maybe for a little while, they'll feel better after eating or after caffeine or after sugar, you're temporarily better, but it's not holding and your energy is not steady. And that despite that fact, there's all this stuff that should be able to be made into energy, but your body can't tap into it. Wow, I love that metaphor of the, you know, the campfire metaphor <laughs> and the kindling that just goes up so much more easily than the, the logs that can, especially when they're damp. Yeah, mm -hmm. you can't yeah. So imagine have that log burn. <laughs> right. So is that, it, is our body fat, does that, go in the, the log pile, the soggy log pile. <laughs> to, draw, to draw the analogy out into biochemistry, the, the logs are the triglycerides and the kindling is the glycogen and the burning of all of that is a process called beta oxidation. And in terms of our body fat, you know, I have this, this, weird, this weird fantasy about like just stopping the world for a year and fixing a whole lot of things. And one of the things that's on this list in my, in my, my, my little Walter Mitty fantasy is to fix a lot of language. Uh, the word fat makes me nuts because it means mm. five completely different things that are like not related at all. So um, uh, dietary fats, dietary oils, uh, tri cir circulating triglycerides in the bloodstream, uh, body fat under the skin, body fat around the organs, body fat inside the organs, body fat in the bloodstream. All those things are different, but we call all them fat. So to answer your question, yeah, it is fat, but when we're healthy, we're storing that as triglycerides and glycogen that we can tap into easily. But when the body can't do that well, you still store and the overflow ends up being fat inside the liver and around the liver cells. And we heard about like belly fat or visceral fat being bad. And this is bizarre. Uh, we, we did think that in the past. We thought that it was bad. And we thought that when it was inflamed, that that was a bad thing. Now we know it's a protective mechanism. It's your body doing its best not to let all this stuff gunk up inside the liver. So you're trying to make visceral fat. And when visceral fat's inflamed, this is wild, it's inflamed because it's trying to grow new cells or it's trying to grow new fibrous tissue so it can house new cells. It's trying to make a safe place to put this toxic fat. And oh when it can't gosh. do that, then the overflow is in the liver. The liver can put some inside the cells, but then it builds up outside the cells. And the most dangerous thing that happens to our bodies that causes pretty much all the diseases that are not infections or accidents, the common thread is that too much fuel gets jammed inside our cells and gets forced into the mitochondria. And that's what causes cell death, oxidative stress, aging, you know, chronic disease. So when your body has fat elsewhere or high amounts of glucose or triglycerides in the blood or fatty liver, those are all last ditch efforts to keep this fuel from going inside the engine. Because you put fuel in the engine, your cells are dead. You know, and that's, that's, that's the most, that's worse than any toxin, that, that's, the, that's like being derived of oxygen. So when there's high amounts of glucose in the blood, for example, it's just like an airport that's got nowhere for the planes to land. And it's saying, stay up in the pattern, keep flying around the pattern, because the runway's full. So when your body's in a high fuel state and you can't process more fuel, you'll stick it in the organs, you know, you'll leave it in the blood, you'll put it wherever, but you're trying hard to not let it get inside the cells. That's what the, that's what the attempt is all about. Wow, what an incredible way to explain <laughs> yeah. that. I think it just finally makes Click. sense to me how that... Well, you know, and we've, we've, we've been confused and thought that high blood glucose, insulin resistance, that, that, that there's somehow these random errors or glitches. And they're not errors or glitches. They are safety mechanisms. So your body intentionally makes itself insulin resistant as one more way to prevent fuel from entering the cells when the cells can't handle that. So the question is not, how do we make this insulin go lower? The question is not, you know, why is this, how do we siphon glucose out of the bloodstream? The trick is, how do we change this balance? The body is now burning fuel properly and it can put it down in the right places. 
You know, I want to I wanted to, to share something with you. I, I watched this TED Talk, and I'm going to flub it up a little bit, but maybe you can help me. Really cool guy talking about diabetes saying maybe we've got it wrong. Mm-hmm. Maybe we've got it backwards. Maybe it's not the fat and the and and on all that stuff. Maybe it's that's the per- preservation that the body's doing. Yep, that's exactly so right. So maybe you really need to look at it like that, like it, like people that have diabetes, they can't help it. They really can't, and their body's showing, right? So it's like a backwards kind of way to look at things uh, well, from what is- we're taught. Yeah, and the bizarre thing is that I spoke to a gentleman last week who was a friend of a friend, and he confided that he was struggling. He's about 380 pounds, and he was his doctors were surprised that he was not diabetic. And this has been a big point of confusion, too, because some people seem to gain a lot of weight and not become unhealthy. And there's others who are not all that heavy, but they will then develop diabetes or heart disease. And so the person who was 380 pounds, they were an outlier in terms of how well their bodies could grow fat. Most people okay. couldn't do that. But because his body could, he was able to take all that fuel and make it mostly into subcutaneous fat, um, which is rather harmless. And so he was, he's, he's still at risk and we still want to improve his health. But he had a higher fat tolerance point. He, his body could make fat better than someone else's could. And he wasn't happy with it for a lot of reasons. He couldn't breathe well at night. He, he's got joint problems. But chemically, it's protecting him against this extra fuel by having a bigger rug to sweep the fuel under is what it really is. Whereas someone else, there, there's many people that are no classified as normal body weight. Maybe they don't have enough muscle mass, but they're not overtly heavy. And yet they could be developing diabetes before he could. So they don't have that same ability to grow fat. Their body can't do that. So whatever extra fuel they have, either it gets stuffed inside the organs or it's just circulating as glucose or triglycerides. So yeah, that's the difference. Mm. Then, you know, uh, one of the things he said was um, that he had, you know, made a mistake and someone came in to the, to the ER and he I've made a judgment. Exactly, you have exactly. it? It was, it was Peter Atia. It was a really yeah, good you're right. It was amazing. Yeah. And he was saying that he felt bad later because he, you know, made a judgment. And basically mm-hmm. what it turned out to be was that this person couldn't help it, that it mm-hmm. wasn't their fault. Mm-hmm. And I love that that's what you're explaining kind of says that. It's like your Absolutely. body's trying to tell you something. It's showing you something. Thank you. Well, right? what's, happening, what's happening too is that your, your appetite is not reflective of the fuel that you're carrying. It's reflective of the fuel that you have access to. Right. So you could have all this fuel you theoretically have access to, but if your body can't get to it, you're, you're low energy and you're, you're trying to get fuel. But at the same time, part of your system is doing, working so hard to block all this extra fuel from getting out that it's just like you're hungry. It's just like, you know, like you're adrift at sea and you've got all this water, but you can't drink because it's salt water. You know, that's, that's where your body is. You've got this, this fat in the in places that are excessive and, and yet you're, you need energy. So yeah, people can still be hungry in ways, even though there's too much there that they could use with. I love the so how water is analogy it? too. He's got great yeah. analogies, right? No, so great. So how common is it and how can we tell if, if this is, you know, what's happening inside our bodies? That's a really good question. So the this, the state that I'm describing, this fuel overload in the organs, it's really a continuum of events that when it's far enough along, we would call fatty liver syndrome. So a lot of things are on a continuum. Like you guys know that a normal TSH is not always great and that you're, you can be outside of optimal. And we always have these magic lines in medicine to where you, know, you wake up one morning and your fasting blood sugar is 126. Well, now you're diabetic. The morning before when you were 125, you were not diabetic. And, and of course, the 125 person is not in the same category as someone who's 85, but they're both non-diabetic, right? So things are on a continuum, even though we draw a line and define a disease at some certain point. And fatty liver disease by itself, even the real active form is way more common than people think. But the earlier stages of that are incredibly common. One researcher argued that the main way you would know if someone has this happening is if they fall into any one of three categories. So one is just overweight based upon height and weight. One would be obese based upon height and weight. And the other is where they have too little lean mass. So that's been called the skinny fat or TOFI is a word that's used, thin outside, fat inside, to where they're not too heavy, but they've got too little lean body mass. And current estimates argue that probably 80, 90% of adults fall into one of those three categories. You know, there's, there's a few people that do not. 
So this is a, a prevalent problem. And then actual active fatty liver disease, it's hard, it's hard to rule it out and say someone doesn't have it. But when it is there and it does show up, that's at least 40% or more of adults today in, in any active form. Wow. Mm -hmm. So what can we do? <laughs> <laughs> right, so help. Well, that's the exciting part about this. So all these roads leading to Rome and Rome being the liver, the cool part is this is amongst the most resilient, regenerative parts of your body. You know, in the course of, of no exaggeration, 20, one study that I saw that inspired me to use this number was they looked at people who were hospitalized from Tylenol overdose and had liver damage, and they looked at their rate of, of repair. And within 28 days, they could have fully normal liver function again. So when your liver is harmed in some major ways, it can reverse quickly. And we've seen this. So the protocol that we use, we'll talk about, is one that we first developed for diabetes and then started seeing that there was more overlap with fatty liver and diabetes. And we were watching and tracking for it more closely via specialized tests and ultrasounds. And we saw that, yeah, overt fatty liver disease will reverse in that time frame too. And those who are on the continuum, and they're not aware of having a liver problem, but their appetite, their energy levels, and their weight just don't spontaneously sync up into a good place. Then yeah, that can reverse. And the part that excites me most from hearing of people who have gone through the program, I love hearing about, yeah, I dropped you know, 15 pounds. I really get excited when they say they dropped a lot of inches because that's even, that's even a bigger change in the pounds. But also jazz to hear about low triglycerides, low blood pressure. But the thing that, single thing that lights, oh, and also thyroid function. So we always warn people now, you've got to recheck your thyroid after doing the program because if you're on treatment, you may not need the same treatment. We've had tons of people to wear suddenly they're overdosed. Suddenly the pills that were barely working are now too much for them. So that, that's a phenomenal change too. And, and the coolest level of all is when they tell us six months later, hey, I did this six months ago and I have saw some great short-term effects. And then afterward, I went back to you know, the reasonably healthy diet that I was doing before and it's working. It didn't in the past. You know, I, was, I was eating well and I was trying, but I wasn't getting the results I wanted. And now after the switch, I can do these reasonable steps and I'm maintaining these results. So that's so the coolest part of all is when the body changes. It's a true reset. It lasts. It's a reset. Yep. <laughs> it's a reset, right? It's a true reset. I'm glad you, you brought up the thyroid because that was my next question is how does that factor into this, you know, the, the body system? You know, it's bizarre. So we always think about what is the driver of inflammation and that's the thing behind autoimmunity, behind a lot of just chronic pain patterns. And we've thought about a lot of exotic causes. And you know, maybe it's the fact that our bodies have a lot of plastics, or maybe we were exposed to molds, or maybe we got chronic infections. And you know, it's never, it doesn't have to be one thing in isolation. There can be a multiple factors for some people. But there was a, some tables I looked at that showed the relative effects of different inflammatory cytokines. So there's some cytokines that come from toxic exposure, some from uh, infections, you know, some from other immune stressors. And then there's those that are formed by this kind of fat that builds up inside the organ cells. So those are called adipokines, uh, the adipose like fat and then cytokine like cytokine. And they are the most powerful pro-inflammatory chemical in our bodies. So just just like seriously, like two grams of extra fat inside the organs, two grams, like two paper clips worth of mass, that extra two grams can be a larger driver of inflammation than having a raging viral infection would be, or having, you know, tons of mercury in the body. Those things are bad. I don't want to discount that. But if you could, if you could rank it all up, that's like the biggest poison there is. You know, one study I looked at was taking, was evaluating the effects of, uh, adiposity on arthritis. And the old thought was that people who were heavier had sore joints because they were like wearing a backpack all day and they were just carrying more weight and straining the joints harder physically. But then they showed that the changes that would occur in terms of decreased pain from just a few pounds of weight loss when it was from the right places, it wasn't, it wasn't a physical effect. It was completely a chemical effect. So it's not carrying the weight that makes you hurt. It's the chemical inflammatory effects of the weight that makes your body just inflamed and sore. And that's no different for autoimmunity. So this is a big driver and perpetuator of autoimmunity. And then the other level behind that is when your metabolism is compromised and your body can't access fuel, well, 
it's, it's, you're already struggling to get to it, so then you intentionally lower your metabolic rate. And guess who does that? Your liver does that, and it does that by changing what kinds of thyroid hormones are in circulation. So this is called non-thyroidal illness syndrome, and it's confused a ton of people. So what happens is your body will have perhaps a normal, maybe even a lower TSH level, uh, a lower T3 level, even below range. And then if someone did bother to measure, they might even see a high reverse T3. And this is thought of as being also like a glitch or an accident, and it's not. It's your body intentionally diverting more thyroid hormone away from active forms toward inactive forms. And it's a means of trying to protect yourself against a state in which you can't safely burn fuel. So yeah, your liver is also involved with changing thyroid hormones in those situations. Wow. And many will look at that pattern and they'll think, oh, there's some conversion problem. The body cannot make T3. We've got to give more T3. No, the body can choose that. The body's doing that on purpose. You're trying to, you're trying to be gentle on a sputtering engine with a flashing light as you're driving back to the garage. So the trick is not how do you push the gas pedal harder? The trick is, you know, why is the engine sputtering? <laughs> yeah. Right. So if somebody, say, has a, a lower T3, free T3, is your first uh, course of action going to be let's, let's, let's give some love to the liver? Well, there's, there's, yeah, so it could be a matter of simply extra trapped toxic fat inside the liver being the culprit. There could be other culprits, but it's called non-thyroidal illness syndrome. If you guys are curious, I'll give you a link. Um, I got, for some reason, something pushed me. That's right, someone wrote in and asked about this, and this person had a young daughter who was told that she had unusually high levels of reverse T3 and that it was a problem with her chronic fatigue, and she was about to be put on high dose T3 therapy to, to address that. And oh. I'm gonna just go in the chat and throw this yeah. link in here. So here's the, so I saw this question come in and my concern, so back to the engine analogy, let's say that you had some kind of super, I don't know, nitrous oxide that would just force your engine to put out all that it could. So that could, obviously that could strain your engine at any time, but if you did that when your engine was flashing a red light and sputtering, that's probably the worst time to do that, right? You know. So that's what often happens when someone's in this state, they're tired, their T3 is low. Well, how can we, how can we like pour nitrous oxide in this engine? I'm like, no, well, how do we fix this engine? How do you figure out what's wrong with it? So I got this question and I've had this question in various forms before and I've addressed it a lot in person with people and with my doctors, they've got this down, but I wanted to make a statement that was just like completely straightforward and covered like all the possible aspects of this to make it completely clear to anyone why this is a matter of finding a cause, but not just pouring in extra thyroid hormones to make someone, and even if someone were exhausted, and even if it, a cause wasn't identified, megadose thyroid hormone could give them more energy for a little while. You know, so could, so could cocaine. You just imagine if you, <laughs> you could, you could right. sleep three hours a night, and you could do lots of cocaine, and you would have more energy for a little yeah, while. Right, or a quad moving. shot. I mean, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but you wouldn't be moving to a place of better health, and you wouldn't be addressing the cause of fatigue. And there's a right. point at where thyroid hormones can be non-specific stimulants, and someone could take them and say, hey, I feel better. Okay, I'm glad you feel better, but I want to make sure you keep feeling better and that we're not just pouring in a stimulant. So that's well, a temporary right feeling stimulant. better, right? I mean, because yeah. that's kind of what you want as a patient, you know? So you, you go into the doctor and you're like, I want to feel better. And so, yeah. you know, some of the doctors are like, okay, and then they do this and then they feel better. And then eventually- And I think everyone means well. They like, do. Yeah. Yeah. But this gets- to the root of the of the matter and that's what's so exciting about it and you know I know we always keep our ear to the ground for what are the experts saying and especially what are the experts saying as a collective and coming around to this you know the liver and all of that it's we're hearing more and more about that in the thyroid community and mm -hmm. um it's really fascinating and, and I think can be really empowering information to, for people to, you know, keep their eyes and ears open to. So, yes, thank you for uh, 
explaining that so succinctly and I can't wait to read this article and for anyone listening we'll be sure and put these links in the show notes so it's, if you're listening like, on like, iTunes or something you can go to the it's like uh, 16, refresh podcast notes and it's like 16,000 words it's ridiculously comprehensive I just like covered all facets of this like just no possible points of confusion and <laughs> <laughs> that's great of course you did right? well, that's <laughs> how you wrote there is right. complexity to this. This is not a simple, you know, thing to understand. And, you mm. know, I think uh, as thyroid patients, you know, we hear in our community, especially our thyroid 30 players are like, this is a complex condition. We yeah. understand that as people trying to reclaim our health, that it, you know, can, there's a tendency to want to oversimplify it, you know, by some parts of the med medical community. And I think also by patients, of course, we want the, the quick, quick fix, fix, the bandaid, the pill, the solution that comes, you know, in the can or the whatever. And, um, you know, I appreciate you going into that depth because, um, we need to understand that. And we want, there's so many people who want these answers and who want to understand, the whole big picture so that we can honor our bodies in the best way that we possibly can. Or for those so. who don't want to know, and they do just want the quick fix, you can't fault them. But, right. oh, for sure. but with this, we are sharing. It is not easy. You're explaining. It's complex. It is. And, and it can be easy, I guess. I didn't mean to use that word, but it's just complex. And so we want to get that out there for those people who do want the, the supplement. And you can't, you know, you can't blame them. We're a convenient society. We sure. want things to be yeah. easy. And so it makes sense. But uh, we want to explain it and we want to let people know it's well, I want there's to a lot to it. If, if, if their approach is one that seems helpful in the short term, and, but, but if they have risks from the approach, they should at least be educated about what those risks are and what the right. other options would be on the table. People should just be able to make that choice. Yep. Yeah. So is the metabolism reset diet something that you um, recommend for both hypo and hyperthyroid patients looking to lose weight or do you have you know, any or? Yeah, for sure. And with the, with the context of addressing their abnormal levels and taking care of that, then yeah, struggles with energy, struggles with weight. You know, I think about the three things we experience of our, our appetite, our, our body size, and then just our, our energy or, or fatigue. And I think we've been led to expect that you can't have all three, you know, that you can have almost like your money or your time, that same thing. You could work all day and have money, but have most free time or the opposite. So I think we've been told that with our health about like, yeah, appetite, weight, and energy. So people have come to expect that they can eat healthy food. They can um, not stress about their appetite and they can probably feel really good from that and have good energy, but they may not have the weight outcome they want. Or on the other hand, they could, you know, go on a highly restrictive diet and just like micromanage things and starve themselves and get their weight where they want it to be. But they sure as heck know that they're not going to be energized and they're going to be fighting against their appetite if they're there. So, so yeah, the goal about this is how do you get those three things to come and line up again? Because when your body's healthy, they should. Mm -hmm. Man, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> it does feel like, you know, that is the elusive thing is to get all those things happening at the same time. It's, it's like, like a Rubik's Cube where you get one color on and the others get pushed yeah, off. And yeah, like, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or like whack-a-mole, you know, it's like all one thing, another thing pops up and yeah. And I'm definitely, I fall in, I'm so like glued because I absolutely fall into that camp of, you know, it is hard for me to, I can eat really well and I can be really active and I can eat well while I'm being really active, but I, you know, I'm a chef. I love food. I probably overdo it. And so I struggle with weight and, you know, now I'm thinking so much about my whole system and my liver too, but yeah, this is not like 50 new rules to live your life by. You know, I've right. got just a chapter that talks about maintenance. It's really not complicated. The maintenance is not a detailed thing. But the real idea is you can be autoimmune paleo, you can be vegan, you can be Mediterranean, you can, whatever kind of diet you're on, healthy diet, that's cool. There's ways you can do the 20-day program within those guidelines. And then afterward, you should be able to go back to a meal program that fits with your life and your beliefs and your preference as well and get better health from that than you were before. 
Well, mm. I was just about to ask you to give us a little bit of the gist of the metabolism um, reset, but I guess you kind of did. Can you elaborate just a little bit more for those that are listening? Of course, we want them to go out and get your book, but I want them to understand a little bit more about kind of what you were thinking when you planned this and how did you get 20 days and, and where it came from and how it well, works. So, so that part of it, this was first made for diabetes and there was a study that I saw in which this was done in the UK and they did a meal replacement program with diabetics for six weeks and they saw via CT scan that their pancreases could regrow the vesicles that stored insulin. So this was type two diabetics, but many had been so for over a decade. And so it physically changed them into non-diabetics and they were stable afterward. Now, the original study, I thought that's awesome. Any way you could do that is worth it. Uh, it was highly restrictive. It was about 600 liquid calories and it wasn't even good food. It was, you know, I don't know, like a lot of- Insure? <laughs> yeah, it was stuff like that. Seriously, right? like corn syrup solids and corn oil things. Mm. And stuff that I wouldn't tell, I wouldn't feel good about telling someone to consume. So we kept testing how we could do that if we made it to where there was some solid food involved, we wanted someone not to lose muscle mass along the way, so we wanted to use a bit more protein. Uh, with rapid weight loss, there can also be concerns about uh, causing gout or gallstones to unmask. So we wanted to be highly dense in some great quality vegetables, highly alkaline. So all these nuances, and what we came down to was a four-week program that was a shake for breakfast and lunch and a pretty reasonable dinner meal and even some optional snacks if they were needed throughout the day. All right. Equaling up to the 600. Well, no, I'm so, I'm so sorry. Thank you so much for bringing that out. Yeah. No, we, we didn't stay at the 600 calorie target. Okay. We don't use a calorie target in this. Okay. Yeah, we, we give to make we sure. some protein targets, some healthy amounts of resistant starch, and some good foods to include. But no, it does end up being more than that, but it's really not based on a calorie target. Most, okay. most find they're like more than twice above that if they were to actually count and track. Okay. All right, just wanted to make sure. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I didn't want to leave people thinking that was a 600 no, calorie program no, because that would no. be really horrible. Yeah. It would be scary. Mm -hmm. It sounds so doable too, and it's so nice, you know, for uh, for this community that <sighs> struggles with weight, you know, <laughs> to have these options where it isn't just about the number on the scale. This is about really um, doing something so positive for your entire system. And I, I'm curious, because I know, you know, we hear this a lot from people when we're doing our thyroid 30 wellness adventures is alcohol. Alcohol is, you know, people love their glass of wine or their, you know, drink a beer while they're making dinner or whatever. Or just, it's such a part of our social lives, you know, so common. Do you have a stance on that? Um, I, I mean, obviously both during the, metabolism reset but also after when people have maybe reclaimed some of this liver function and things like that do you have a are you are you just come like, on no we're ready, we're ever ready. Or, I'm, just, I'm just letting yeah. you finish the question i'm, I'm ready to go <laughs> <laughs> i so yeah the best available evidence suggests that there's a certain amount that's probably negligible as far as health detriments uh there's probably no amount that's harmless and the thought about alcohol having health benefits that's, that's actually gone by the wayside in medical research. So what happened was that there were a lot of data suggesting that people that consumed no alcohol had a higher rate of death than those that consumed a small amount of alcohol. And a lot of that was cardiovascular death. So if you looked at that data from just high up and took it totally at face value, it would be reasonable to conclude that a little alcohol was protective against cardiovascular death. But what happened was, this was about three years ago, some researchers took a deeper look at the data and it turned out that those that don't drink come in two different flavors. So some people don't drink because they just don't drink. You know, maybe there's a religious reason or maybe they just, you know, maybe they had a family member, but whatever it is, they just don't drink. Another group of people medically can't drink. So maybe they had a history of alcohol abuse. Maybe they're on medications that are not compatible with it. Perhaps they've got kidney or liver disease. But the people who medically can't drink because of whatever that medical reason is, they often have more health challenges and they tend to have a higher rate of mortality. So the pitfall was that when they're lumped in with the non-drinkers, they make it look like there's more death amongst the non-drinkers. And it makes it look like the light drinkers have a protective effect. But once you pull out the people that medically can't drink, and now you only compare those that choose not to drink against those who drink a little bit, there's no more health benefit. And the mortality rate goes lowest with those that don't consume alcohol, even for cardiovascular death. 
um, the thing that shows up the earliest at the smallest intake of alcohol is actually breast cancer risk. And that's even a serving or so per week, it starts to elevate. So if someone does have some risks or concerns that way, that may be one of the most emergent concerns. But brain aging, uh, cardiovascular health, cancers in general, 90% of cancer can be tied to alcohol, tobacco, or obesity, like those three factors. So if someone has some socially on occasion, totally their call, uh, there's probably some amount where the risks are small enough that someone might decide that they're negligible. But the message of someone that go, message that we should go out of our way to add some in for some health protective benefits, that's that's no longer based on current evidence. Mm. Hmm. Good to know. Yeah, I think their wine, <laughs> they're good for you. Um, right. Well, I mean, it's wonderful to feel good all the time too. You know, i that's something I've definitely learned on my healing journey is just that there is such a cost to it. Even a very small or moderate amount of alcohol comes at an energy cost. And when you're, you know, living with Hashimoto's or hypothyroidism and tr always trying to reclaim energy any way you can, it's like this just the math doesn't work out on this anymore. And, and I Isn't have come across some of those new studies that you're talking about that are like, you know, they're really, we can't really say anymore that there's a health okay. benefit to this. My, my son is just about to get his driver's license in a few more months. So I still get to drive him places, which is awesome. We get long talks that I'm sad that we'll lose soon, but mm -hmm. for the day we're coming back from school and I don't know how it came up, but we're just talking about, you know, alcohol, drugs, substances and, and I said, yeah, look, you know, I was a kid. I, I drank too much a few times, and um, I don't think it's an immoral thing. I don't think there's any, you're going to get struck by lightning. But what I, what I realized in my own experience was that the window of time, and, and for sure, I, I, I felt it was fun, it was kind of euphoric, but how, 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 how big the, the fun part was versus how deep and how long the negative part was, the math just didn't add up. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Right. Yeah, agree. What a good trade-off. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Well, sorry to be party poopers, guys, but <laughs> I mean, it's good to know this stuff, you know, yes. and, and good to question and pay attention to, you know, even just how you feel after going to a party and having couple glasses of wine or whatever, there is a, an impact for sure. Well, the goal, the goal to which we all want to feel our best and feel like hedonistically happy and joyous and euphoric, the, the secret that seems so bizarre, but the best way to get that is to be ridiculously healthy. That's the best way to feel as good as possible as you can the biggest percent of the time is to do all the things that, that Dana and Jenny are telling you to do. That's the way to get there. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for Ryan, that. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> we spent the weekend doing yard work at our house, and I was so exhausted yesterday after two full days. We're tearing down our potting shed and, you know, going to the dump and ugh, just the whole, like, our bodies are tired. And last night, my husband said, do you, wanna, you want me to make you a cocktail? And I said you know what? I, t I totally talked myself out of it. A cold beer or something sounds so good right now, but instead I had a, um, some electrolytes in a big, big water bottle, hydrated, took my adaptogens and I felt great. It felt, it feels good to, to say, I really taxed my body this weekend. And instead of doing something depleting for it, because it's going to feel good for mm -hmm. a half hour, 60 minutes, it, it felt like, a victory for sure to, to just say no i'm gonna actually replenish instead of deplete but we all have to you know walk that line find our way along our own healing paths <laughs> um you know usually we start more with the personal aspect but before we we sign off today um i know that this book has personal significance for you and i wondered if maybe you could just sure. um, leave us with a little bit of that story. You know, honestly, the, um, I heard someone say that if the, the pain in your life is like uh, an archer pulling back a bow, the further that bow is pulled, the further the arrow can fly, you know? And so for me, that was like growing up as a kid who couldn't do physical things and was tormented for being fat. Um, yeah, I had some very dark times and the first stage of life was I guess I wasn't so much frustrated or upset because I didn't know anything different. You know, I was a bookish kid, but I couldn't really play or do sports and that was okay. But then around adolescence, you know, we hit a point to where 
we actually care what others think about us, <laughs> or at least for me, it took that long. Maybe others figured that out sooner, but I was slow to figure that out, but I really started to care around adolescence. And yeah, I was not doing well in that regard. Um, there was fewer people who were heavy, uh, and the idea about it being not okay to, fat, there wasn't even a thing as fat shaming. It was just normal that you would make fun of people who were bigger than, than others. And so I was a, an outlier in that regard. And and adolescence is a tough time anyway, you know, figuring out your identity, your body's changing and whatnot. And yeah, it, it sucked and it completely compelled me to want to figure out how to change myself. And, you know, the experience was that the quality of your health, uh, if it wasn't where you wanted it to be, nothing else really mattered. You know, if, if you were feeling badly about your body and like it wasn't aligned with what you wanted and you couldn't do things you wanted to do physically, that yeah, nothing else would really make up for that. You know, that was just like the bottom of the, the bottom of the needs. Like you got to plug in the computer before you play with, play with anything else. So I realized that. And I also realized that information could improve that and therefore just completely change your life and let you live a life that you want by just not having that be a block for you. And then also I learned that the information didn't always come from the expected sources. You know, I had, I had seen doctors, I was given medications for my seizures and whatnot. And, but I wasn't really given things that helped to change my health in the ways that I wanted, but, but books and authors and health experts, they, their advice when I acted on it and took some steps to figure out what would work best for me and personalize it and then stuck with it, you know, then was consistent. When I put those things together, it completely changed my life. And I realized as a kid, when I was 12, I'm like, geez, there's stuff that people could figure out that could be this awesome, but they're not really hearing it. And it just planted a seed. And then in my residency, more than anything else, I connected with those who had thyroid disease because I saw that they had a lot of the same symptoms that I had, but lifestyle alone wouldn't do it unless they had some basic normal level of hormonal stability. And also I saw that the recommendations they had to make sense out of the conventional ones were just even worse than now. You know, you could, normal TSHs went up to 12 when I started practicing, you guys. That was, that was normal. Yeah. I can't. Wow, I can't. <laughs> Holy moly. And the alternative world was the Wild West. You know, any symptom could be any mega dose of, of thyroid medicine with, with like no restraint or no caution. So I saw that there was something completely being missed here. And, and I dove deep into that. Uh, 1994 in my residency was when I first started getting into that. And it's been ever since. And that was totally driven by my own, my own history. Hmm. Wow. Well, let's just have a moment of thanks that, you know, that isn't the case anymore, that 12 is considered a normal TSH. And, <laughs> and thanks so much to you for the work you've done. You know, I mean, and we were in the, in the business of cheerleading, right? And we always try to get that across to people that our biggest challenges, if we let them, can become our biggest strengths. And so thank you for sharing that personal story. And thank you for the work that you do for you know for all of us to benefit from so um, no, i just got goosebumps I, if i can super briefly apologize for creating confusion you know i i often say things that are different from what other conventional or natural thyroid experts do and i i completely do not like controversy and confusion i wish to avoid them in all purposes but this stuff is so important and thyroid hormones are life and death and so I, I took a lot of things at face value in my earliest years, but I saw that they didn't pan out in the ways that I expected. So I've always just dug a few levels deeper. And, you know, and, and I hate the fact that I, I say things that often do create confusion or go against what my friends say, but I couldn't live with myself if I didn't give you guys the best information I could find. And that's why we love you. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why I had you on my other show a few times. And that's why we're having you on today because you're just thank one so of those much. pioneers. So, so thank you so much, truly. So thank you so much to Dr. Alan Christensen for being here with us today. And for our listeners, you can find Dr. Christensen's book on, uh, where, where should they go to find the metabolism reset well, you for know, your other books? Thing too that's even easier for them. Let me give you guys a link. Um, each, each month, we do a free challenge. Uh, so we'll, we'll do a, a week's program where someone can learn all about the, the metabolism reset and they can get guidance and cooking videos and they can dive into that first week and try that out. Many get some big benefits in the first week and that's totally cool. You can take that and run with it. Others say, I like this, I want to do the rest. And in which case, yeah, they can grab the book, they can do an online program, but anyone can jump into that first week totally for free and they can go there and 
looks like we've got one kicking off June 3rd for the next one. So, so yeah, that's, that's available for the public. Awesome. Well, thank you. And that's great to know about. And thank you all for joining us for me, where we give you the inspiration and information you need to live thyroid healthy. To receive your free Thyroid Thrivers grocery guide, you can visit us at thyroidrefresh.com. And to learn more about Thyroid 30, our revolutionary 30-day wellness adventure, you can go to thyroidrefresh.com slash thyroid30. You do have the power to heal, and we have the tools and the great minds like Dr. Christensen to share their incredible information and research and life's work with you. So um, thank you again for being here with us. My pleasure. And if you've enjoyed this podcast and would like to help us continue and continue to inspire and empower thyroid patients worldwide, please leave us a review on iTunes. It would make our day. It really would. You are what makes this community the amazing resource it is. We so appreciate your listenership and your support. We're Dana and Jimmy wishing you the best of health. See you next time. Thanks. Guys. Bye. Thanks, guys. Mm-hmm.